So uh, I'm kind of a roving scientist uh, at Los Alamos National Laboratory, and um, I really haven't thought about kinases for about five years. Um, so uh, that sort of gives you my, a, a little bit of where I'm coming from, but I guess I was on the road to becoming an expert at one time on experimental physicists, and now I see myself coming back to uh, examining these problems. Um, in, in the outline, um, uh, first I'll talk about some small animal scaling studies that I've done in protein kinase. So um, I came to Los Alamos uh, working with Jill True House uh, on small animal scattering. And as, as Don described in his talk, you can use small animal scattering to characterize large scale shape changes. Uh, this was really um, demonstrated by Jill uh, in a beautiful experiment in 1988 where she discovered that Calmodulin collapses dramatically when it finds some mice and lunching kind of uh, fragments. And uh, this was clearly seen in the scattering data and was later confirmed by Chris Wadley. Um, so in the experiment that I understood, uh, this was with um, Jill and also a close collaboration with Sean Francis of Vanderbilt, who did uh, uh, a lot of the um, molecular biology. Uh, we knew that uh, PKG extended upon binding cytochene P do some experiments on the Jill's lab in 1997. Uh, but the question was whether or not that extension was, uh, well, what was the cause of that extension to the end of or mechanistically? And um, so what uh, Sharon Francis did uh, to remove the compounding effects of diamond is she created a deletion mutant that's missing the first 52 residues of the end terminus. This is the nine residues in the um, and uh, as a consequence, it didn't analyze the solution, and each of the uh, complexes in solution only found two cyclotene P's. Uh, PKG is also interesting because instead of uh, existing as two separate subunits, uh, it actually is in one long part of that chain. And so upon dissociation, these parts <coughs> can uh, float off, and uh, you, you, you don't lose the uh, signal of the whole molecule, it just changes the confirmation of the molecule. So we thought we could address some interesting problems with this. Uh, so the three questions that we were aiming to answer, um, one is whether or not we could tell whether or not there was a two-state extension of, of the molecule versus a kind of a progressive elongation through some more complicated process. Um, is the elongation of the dimer due to an internal rearrangement of the R and C domain, or is it somehow also involved uh, the dimer interaction itself? And um, then, which binding sites trigger the elongation? So this is kind of where we're coming from. Um, the first thing we determined is, is that, yes, uh, this monomer does extend upon any separate TNP. And uh, beyond 2 to 1 separate TNP to PKG, we didn't see any further extension. So this was evidence that we were really saturating it there. And that was consistent with what we knew. And uh, the other thing we did in um, a couple of different ways is to determine that every one of the intermediate uh, stuff of GNP concentrations, uh, the um, scattering data at every intermediate, con uh, in intermediate point was just a linear combination of the endpoints. So this was evidence that we did have a two-state transition rather than some uh, more complicated process going on. We looked at a, a, a couple of others too. Uh, the next thing we did was we picked up some methods that were originally used by Engelman and Moore, uh, described in 1975. Um, these methods were used um, to, uh, in a kind of heroic uh, small neutron scattering effort to map out the sudden structure of the ribosome. And uh, it's based on this idea that just by looking at radius, radius generation of different subunits, um, you can relate those to uh, um, separations between the center of mass of, of different subunits uh, in, in complex. So I won't get into the details, but what we did find as a result of this by comparing the dimer data with the monomer data, we determined that the distance between the monomer center of mass and the dimer center of mass uh, shifts by 10 angstroms um, in, upon extension. And uh, we also determined that this degree of extension was completely accounted for by um, internal uh, rearrangement of, of the monomer. And 
And uh, finally, we wanted to look at the mechanism of elongation. And Cher and Francis have uh, collected some data on the binding of PKG to uh, the low affinity site and the high affinity site. And so um, we developed a simple model of binding and then asked the question, uh, how much, um, what's the occupancy of the A and B sites and combined A and B site occupancy at different concentrations of both of the and P? And how does that compare to the fraction of um, our monomer that uh, we calculated in the extended state? And we found that uh, the fraction of the extended state did not correlate with the B site occupancy, uh, but it did um, correlate with the A site occupancy. So binding to the A site is required for extension, which is consistent with what we know. Um, it, it, it's consistent with the idea that um, this extension is due to the dissociation of RNC upon uh, binding site separate gene. Did you say A site? Uh, the, the A site, yeah, the A site. So um, we also uh, had a model that was developed shortly before these experiments by Chen Shantan. And um, this sort of speaks to the idea of modeling using, using SACS data. So I just want to bring this up in this interesting test case. Um, so Chen Shang had developed this model based on looking at PKA scattering data. Um, and um, we compared the collapsed state uh, PKG monitoring data to this model. And found there was really an excellent agreement uh, between the model and the data without any additional requirements. So this spoke to the consistency of the uh, PKG and the PKA data. But um, after Susan's uh, lab had solved the structure of the whole enzyme, which had a significantly different structure from um, had a significantly different structure. Um, from uh, the, uh, the model that came from Chang, Chang Shun. Uh, we uh, compared that to the data and also looked at was an excellent agreement. So I think this uh, speaks to one of the challenges of um, using small and scattering to model shapes, and it doesn't so much, um, it doesn't, it wouldn't be pessimistic about this, it just means that we have to describe our models in a way that respects the fact that um, different shapes with the same RG uh, can have really a very similar fit to the data. So we need to develop our models respecting that and not expect that there will be a single structure that's going to have these uh, sense experiments. And we need other data to constrain. Um, so uh, the next thing I want to talk about just briefly is kind of how I communicate to my colleagues at Los Alamos about the importance of the um, combinational ensemble many of whom are working systems biology, and actually I myself work um, now more than half time on systems biology type problems. And uh, that's uh, looking back to this experiment um, by Bob Austin and Hans Braunfelder, uh, which demonstrated that uh, myoglobin uh, generative recombination exhibits a distribution of uh, reaction rates rather than a single reaction rate, so that uh, when people develop um, uh, reaction kinetic models, um, you might need to think about uh, the fact that the simple reaction rates for the heaters are actually much uh, broader, potentially. Um, and that those reaction rates uh, in this uh, paper were interpreted as coming from some underlying computational distribution. Um, that different confirmations could have potentially different reaction rates. And uh, this was interpreted, the reaction rates were interpreted in terms of the kind of Arrhenius law, and uh, the distribution of rates was um, displayed as a distribution of this uh, information energy. And the thing to note is that in these distributions, the mean is, um, the, the uh, width of the distribution is comparable to mean. And uh, not only is this true for genetic recombination, but more recently, uh, so she did a series of experiments where high concentrations of substrate did black societies uh, apparently exhibited uh, a distribution of forward reaction rates in the enzyme kinetics. And again, uh, in this case, if you look at the, uh, the width, it's comparable to the mean. And what this means um, 
is that at, at minimum, the uh, rates that you use in reaction uh, polymers uh, maybe don't quite have the same meaning that people are used to thinking about it. So I think it's, uh, some um, kind of derivative is derived from this distribution. But moreover, um, the linear noise approximation, if you want to use some stochastic modeling, really uh, it wouldn't be valid um, for cases like this where the width of this is comparable to the mean. So this is kind of how I communicate to some of my assistant biology colleagues at the works on this issue. Um, now, I want to move on to the few scattering studies. So in thinking about the computational ensemble, we always want to use some experiments to characterize the ensemble. Um, and um, early on with uh, Saul Gruner and Steve Elick, um, I had done some uh, experiments on few scattering, which I think is an underexploited method for characterizing uh, the conformational ensemble. Um, it's not a magic bullet, but I'll show you um, if you get some information you don't get otherwise. So uh, really, um, well, I'm not going to show it to you, but um, I'll just tell you that the, the Bragg scattering basically gives you properties uh, that are related to uh, probability distribution of uh, individual uh, atoms. Um, so if you think about some larger conformational distribution, P of X, the Bragg scattering kind of scattering gives you a marginal information about this marginal distribution on individual atoms without giving you information about correlations. Uh, so you get mean position, you get um, RMSDs. And the diffuse scattering, essentially what it gives you is insight into the, um, the next higher order distribution, which is the two-point distribution. Um, so it gives you information about correlations between pairs of atoms in, in the crystal structure. Um, and this information is um, complementary to other information that you get through other means by, say, NMR or spectroscopy. Um, so the background patterns uh, that can be shown are related to um, a uh, uh, correlation um, uh, function of fluctuations. And in this case, what we did is to look at stack nuclease. We, we looked at the background features. We measured them as we would measure Bragg peaks and put those features on something that looks like a, uh, a Bragg lattice, except at each point, instead of measurement of, of um, the Bragg intensity or the measurement of diffuse intensity. And we use this uh, in combination with the, with the Bragg piece to try to do some sort of refinement. And in this case, it was a very simple model where we only added two extra parameters. One is a correlation length, which gives you an idea, let's say on an atom, how far away do I have to go in order to find an atom that no longer is paying attention to the motions. Um, and it was about 10 angstroms in this case. Um, and then for uh, it, it gives you an idea of the overall magnitude of these of these motions. Um, this is a general method that could be applied to any uh, crystal for which to be scattering is significant for many crystals. And so I think the possibility of using this for kinase is is, um, is interesting. Um, and also, this gives you another handle for testing molecular dynamic simulations. So uh, just as we saw uh, in yesterday's talk. Uh, Margaret's talk. Uh, additional uh, type of data that can be used in this book is uh, tree scattering. And um, there's a recent paper, um, Boris Beinhold and Jeremy Smith's lab. Uh, they had taken this um, stand nucleus of tree scattering data that um, uh, we had collected and we gave them this data and they tested uh, whether or not they could reproduce uh, the tree scatter and simulate it from market dynamic simulations, and they discovered they didn't have um, enough of a, a long enough trajectory to fully uh, converge the simulations on the data. But what they did observe, which was interesting, is that as they ran a longer trajectory, uh, they observed a convergence of the ensemble that they were getting towards the uh, these scattering. They estimated that they might need about up to a microsecond of simulation time in, in order to really test this uh, effectively. And um, this was kind of the first uh, contact I had with anything remotely kinase like. Uh, we applied this uh, method of analyzing the scattering to crystals with calodulin complex with 
Cal uh, and the kind of protein kinase uh, to alpha fragments. And um, this is just to demonstrate that really um, you can go beyond just measuring these lower background features and characterize streaks and diffraction pattern patterns which are common. And there's some uh, promise for using this type of analysis to you know, improve um, the description of uh, crystal structures. So um, I've all of this um, about experimental probes of um, the combinational ensemble uh, reminds me. My, my wife is a philosopher, by the way, which is why I tend to bring these kinds of nuances up. But um, so it reminds me of uh, Plato's allegory of the cave. So um, I think about experimentalists here uh, watching a wall of shadows. Um, and trying to interpret from the shadows of proteins what the actual conformational ensemble is. And our problem is even more serious because uh, really we have very little insight into the full conformational ensemble. We only get either the mean structure or say two point correlations. There's a larger uh, full conformational ensemble which probably we'll never have access to as for So um, you know, maybe this is for those outdoors experimental science. So um, I envision myself sitting down here and you know, maybe what's it like to be a puppeteer in this you know, scenario? This is where um, computational studies, I think, uh, can at least um, you know, uh, give you some sense of freedom in, uh, if um, you're not perfect right now. So um, I want to talk about now uh, some computational studies of ligand modulation of uh, the ensemble. And what I'd like to do is just uh, demonstrate um, uh, through an example, something to keep in back of your minds when I'm talking about this, is ligand modulation of protein vibrations. So um, imagine here um, we have a protein that's vibrating in a normal mode, and you start it out so that it only vibrates in one normal mode. And now imagine taking uh, a ligand and uh, placing it here not to interact on the periphery of the protein. And what that would do to the vibrations of the ligand starting out and the, the protein starting out in the same initial state, and there'd be some perturbation. Uh, there's a small perturbation in this structure. And then imagine what you would do if you put that ligand right in the middle of the hinge, and that causes a larger effect. So this is kind of what we have in mind uh, going, going forward to the next few slides. And the idea um, that um, we wanted to explore also was a kind of a different way of looking at ligand binding in which um, you could consider the uh, protein in the absence of ligands having one ensemble P of X and then in the presence of a ligand in kind of a mean field sense having a different ensemble P prime of X and that these ensembles would be associated with uh, different free energy landscapes in kind of a Boltzmann way. But then it's also possible to, uh, through some external force, um, when you're in this landscape, perturb the uh, protein on, per perturb the conformational ensemble in a non-equilibrium way, um, and then bind ligands. So uh, follow a path like this, or follow an alternative path, which would be more, and this would be like a fluctuating pen bind scenario, and then this would be a just fit type scenario where you first bind the ligand and then relax the conformational distribution. So it's a little bit of a different way of thinking about um, ligand binding. And one um, way that you can uh, characterize thermodynamics in such a picture is using something called the relative entropy. So the relative entropy defined here is um, is actually the free energy that you would need uh, to support to um, it's the work that you need to do on the protein to move it from an equilibrium distribution of p of x to a non-equilibrium distribution of p prime of x. So this is what we have in mind. And if, if you look at um, the kinds of free energies that are involved in this, um, I um, what, what we did is. Uh, to in a normal modes uh, model, all in a normal modes kind of estimate um, the um, relative entropy between two distributions, one in the presence, one in the absence of the ligand. And you get something like five kcals per mole at minimum 
Uh, in my hands, these uh, neural modes simulations get different answers depending on, on how strong the minimization you do. But this was a kind of a um, lower than minimum value. And this is comparable to the uh, mining free energies that you see. And um, with, uh, apologies to Andrew McCann, um, I'm using his thing. Slide here, uh, there's a recent paper coming from his lab where he also estimated uh, for uh, set from C plus days uh, the uh, change in, in motions on ligand binding and found that there were free energies uh, involved in the computational changes that were consistent um, with this idea. And also, um, Joshua Wan has uh, done some nice uh, NMR experiments recently where he showed um, uh, that um, potentially this conformational component of the entropy is significant in ligand binding. So in this picture, um, you can develop all alternative ligand binding pathways. I don't want to get into the details of this, but just to show that it's possible to do a lot with um, this idea and, and looking at ligand binding in a way that um, is a little bit unconventional and might have some potential for even in the context of molecular dynamic simulations. You can play around with them in an the molecular engine. But the thing that we pushed on was this hypothesis that we had in the back of our mind. And that's that, um, in thinking about ligand binding, um, so ligand binding to an allosteric site, um, we want, if it has some functional effect, it should significantly change protein activity. And uh, this means, uh, in our minds, that binding causes a significant change in this uh, probability distribution, P of K. And um, so perhaps binding also significantly changes the conformational ensemble. So cause a large change in P of X. Um, and so there's a hypothesis that you can develop based on this that interactions in native binding sites might cause a large change in the conformational ensemble. Um, now, we didn't have the tools to really fully test this uh, idea with uh, exact models, but what we did is to look at um, a, uh, both coarse grained uh, models of protein divergence and all atom models. And what we found uh, in a large, in this case, a large test case, test set, is, um, uh -oh. I don't think it'd be much good to send them this <laughs> I was very happy with my MacBook Air. Yeah. So, um, Sense because 
the evolutionary trace is, is based on um, characterizing diversity in um, the uh, amino, in the uh, amino acids that are involved in the, that are present on the surface, and there's a lot more diversity in the target recognition across um, different kinases than there is in the active site. Is that a program or procedure? Evolutionary trace. Uh, it, it is a procedure, and there is a website that you can go to and, and use that method as from uh, Olivia uh, right. And so we applied this method to yeah. analyze 50,000 scop domains, and uh, we found that, um, in, in a nutshell, we were able to recapitulate uh, many of the ligand interactions that are found in SCOP. Um, and we have many new predictions as well. So for the purposes of this meeting, um, I just wanted to show another example. This is uh, this method applied to the R subunit of PKA, and we can nicely find both of those cyclic binding sites. Uh, there are significant differences in the results of the method applied to these two sites um, for the A and this should be A subunit in this case. Um, so for the A, A subunit, uh, we, we predict a smaller number of residues than for the, the B subunit, and then we can also how it catches out in terms of um, the performance or described here. Um, we are also interested in extending um, this idea, just think about further bioinformatics implications, um, beyond just predicting where individual sites are, the larger question is, you know, what actually happens when a ligand binds here, and what is it, what is the ligand that binds there? So um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, exploring more what happens when it binds there. So we developed a, a method um, whereby if you uh, give a um, ligand for a protein and the final ligand interaction, um, then you can search along the surface to determine where on the protein surface uh, locally um, you uh, perturb the conformational distribution to a, a great degree. And uh, this is actually kind of um, similar in spirit, I would say, to the poster that I've seen here that comes out of that picture just now. Um, but uh, we found in the case of trypsinogen that we could find a site on uh, trypsinogen that um, was allosterically linked to the um, active site of trypsinogen. And um, there are other uh, ways of um, performing this type of analysis. I'm not sure how this happened. I seem to be missing a slide. But, um, uh, beyond that method, that specific method for looking for special uh, linkages in proteins, there are a number of other possibilities uh, that can be explored. And what I, what I had in this slide <laughs> was just an example of a standard picture of the allosteric linkage where uh, you examine uh, the, in, the impact of binding a link at one site on the free energy of binding at another site. And um, you can formulate that as a problem in a similar way to the way that we formulate this linkage problem. And um, in kind of preliminary ways of doing that, um, we um, have looked at uh, a uh, R subunit domain and we investigated differences in binding of uh, ligands to the A site versus the B site. And um, in binding to the A site, we noticed that there was some sort of coupling to uh, some middle region of the protein here, which does undergo some change in um, binding to. Um, C. But interestingly, when we looked uh, at the coupling of B to A, we actually saw um, a coupling between the B site and, um, and the A site, which I think is consistent with what's known about the uh, allosteric in the situation. And um, these particular residues that we found were highlighted were actually the important ones not only for binding to cyclic uh, A and P, but also important for binding to. Uh, the catalytic subunit. So we think there's some promise in these methods, but we haven't validated them any more near the same degree that we have uh, for these other, other methods. So um, in summary, I just wanted to, uh, you know, sort of um, be, be earnest in addressing uh, uh, Susan's vision for this workshop and, and at the end just uh, 
relate to the work to the workshop themes. Uh, so I think this challenge of understanding how seller is signaling is controlled by modulation and person confirmation ensemble is a great one. Um, it also involves a potential for linkage between structural biology and systems biology, which would be further explored. Um, I, I think uh, the, the interaction with experiment and computation, this uh, small angle scattering is uh, important, and the piece scattering, I think, is an underexploited method to use. And then obviously, computational studies of energy landscapes and, and allosterity are uh, a place where it's all coming together now. And I'm very interested um, in learning to use um, molecular dynamics and other methods beyond these kind of coarse grained approaches that we're using right now and seeing how far we can get and using some more accurate model also for uh, pushing the kinds of methods that we uh, can do. Example: All the changes were just localized to the to the uh, small molecule binding site. So, I'm well, just curious where Alistair is, is coming into picture here. Um, I guess the question is uh, why? Maybe why are we picking up active sites uh, when we use this method that is really based on Alistair? Um, I, I think it's a I think it's a good question. Something we thought a lot about um, and. Um, the, the best rational, rationalization I could think of for that is that in binding to the active site, uh, small molecules also um, uh, might modulate the conformational distribution in a way that's consistent with the current specificity. Um, so um, it's not every um, molecule that binds to an active site that you want to um, uh, be um, modulated. It's, there's some part of specificity that's involved. And uh, modulation and confirmation of distribution is probably important for that. But it's a good question. Can we suggest a link in what you just said? Yeah. The majority of the uh, uh, collisions in solution are not productive with collisions. So do you envision the fact that this, uh, this more productive collision funneling toward a confirmation that is more, uh, you know, would be productive uh, collisions with the, with the substrate? Uh, I think it's a it's a tempting thing to imagine something like that, um, and you know certainly it sounds reasonable. Uh, the the only um, sort of limitations of what we explore at site are um, the uh, are really focused on the site itself. So uh, where might nature have evolved? Or where might these uh, allosteric sites have evolved? They should be at sites. Uh, where it's possible to cause a large change in the conformational distribution. Um, and that's kind of what we're exploring is um, which sites uh, enable uh, such interactions to cause a large change in the conformational distribution. Um, what we'd like to do is actually see how specific um, interactions modulate the conformational distribution as well, and that would involve comparing the natural ligand to just random interactions. And we're really not probing that with these methods right now, um, but it's something that's very, very interesting to define. So I have one comment and one question. And I can't believe the question is that whether the trying to cycle, this is just to be going to the second chain of binding the domain, can you ever just look at isolated second chain of binding the domain, rather than the um, so that we analyze, uh, so, oh sorry, using the scattering? Um, that's something I haven't been involved in, but I think it's, um, especially in light of something that we're very interested in, I think that'd be a great experiment to do. The comment is that the, um, the optimal additional sector G, the only PLC that the equivalent is like the same <laughs> in the absence, we I have this flow, it looks like a piece of the thing or species. So I have a question, um, just out of curiosity, um, you, you're looking at the entropic changes with the, the structural movements, and I was wondering, and it showed you know, pretty good correlation, do you, 
two things. How do you deal with um, entropy of water, and do you deal with that? And secondly, do you ever consider the enthalpic um, interactions that you get with the living body that can offset some of the changes in entropy that you're yeah, but those are great points and things that we really should be worrying about. And frankly, when I started out these studies with these simple models, I anticipated that we need to worry about all those things, but um, really using these very, what I would consider unashamedly dumb models of proteins, uh, <coughs> simple models of proteins, um, the fact is that we got remarkably good bioinformatics results for that, so we pushed that as far as we could. Um, but um, definitely um, now we're thinking about getting more detailed in, in that way about um, how to un unpack the different um, contributions to the change. Can we turn for another question? Sure. Um, yeah, so I, I think it was really nice how you're able to show correlations with the uh, diffuse scattering. So I was, I, I was just wondering, I think um, uh, diffuse scattering can be a, a, a general technique to, to work on, to experimentally look at, at correlated motions uh, in the crystal lattice, and you know, first, uh, uh, can, can this be done on structures that are already in, already, already, um, have already been solved? If people have the data, and and the second question is, how, how well does do the does the diffuse scattering court, um, coincide with the um, uh, dynamics um, um, the, the sort of uh, 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 computational calculation for this? Right. So for the latter issue, we use normal most type models. And um, Chang Ping Ma just published a paper. Well, it wasn't comparing to the scaling. Um, others, uh, Go uh, has previously done study, a lot of actually before my studies on looking at single attraction images. And you can get a correlation between just normal those models and and the scattering data. Um, as, as far as uh, whether or not it's possible to do this for any protein, I would say yes. Um, I think one of the challenges are right now the deposition of data into the, into the data banks, uh, it's limited to the uh, reflections, uh, measures of the reflections, and actually the primary images are not to be found. Um, and there are there are some issues that needs to be considered in setting up the beam line in the right way so that you eliminate background features that were contaminated with beam scattering. So it's not like um, there are some things that need to be done. You know, I, I spent a long time working out what those were, so um, they could be done for any protein, but I'd say they're not things that are standardly done in crystallography. But with the proper uh, practices in collecting the data and with the availability of that data in databases, I, I think it could be done for a large number of proteins. Have you published the protein? Yeah, there's um, a methods of molecular, well, it's the molecular method for molecular biology kind of cookbook recipe for generating these three maps. <coughs> um, it's not, um, I, I say there's just enough information in there for other people to do it, but really for, and I, I've made the software available also that I was using. Um, so, um, but nobody, as far as I know, has yet um, picked it up and tried to use it, so I'm just paying, you know, so if anybody tries to do that, please get in touch with me. I can probably help with that. Okay, so